So good evening, everybody, and welcome to the much-awaited session of today, that is on Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. And the title of today's lecture is Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, 21st Century Impressions. And we have with us your favorite speaker, Dr. Basudara Roy. And before we start, let me tell you a bit about Dr. Basudara Roy, although you know a lot about her. Dr. Basudara has been teaching English for the last nine years as assistant professor in Kareem City College, Jamshedpur, Jharkhand, India. An alumnus of St. Xavier School, Bukaro Steel City, and a gold medalist of Banaras Hindu University, she holds a PhD in diaspora women's writing, and her areas of interest include cultural studies, gender studies, and postmodern criticism. Several of her research papers and book reviews have appeared in national and international journals of repute. As a creative writer, she has been published in journals, magazines, and newspapers like Muse India, Roop Katha, I Mantra, the Z Jaipur Literary Festival blog, The Volcano, The Challenge Celebration, Das Literarish Reviews, Das Voice, Hans India, Setu Triveni, and lot many others. Her analysis of Diaspora Women's short story is entitled Migrants of Hope is published by Atlantic Publishers and it is available on Amazon also if you want to buy it from there you can do that. New Delhi along with her first collection of poems Moon in My Teacup. It is also available on Amazon if you want to buy it. Buy a copy of it. Published by Writers Workshop Kolkata in 2019. So this was a bit about Dr. Basudra Roy, uh, and she is with us. Welcome, Basudra Di. A warm welcome to you for today's session. And now uh, I need to tell you, this is very important that all of the students have yes. been madly waiting for this session. One important thing that it is on Pride and Prejudice, which is their favorite text. Another important thing that Dr. Basudra is going to present. So they are more than excited about it today. So over to you, Basudi. Thank you. Welcome, warm, warm welcome to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Varsha. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Can you hear me? Yes, Basudi, you are audible. Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, so, so thank you so much. You know, uh, it's it's, it's uh, yes, thank you, Anjali. So it's so good to be here. And as I was telling Varsha, it's almost like uh, homecoming for me. Uh, there are two reasons uh, why. It's homecoming for me. Hello. Yes, something something happened in between, and my laptop, you know, hung. So, yes. Yeah, so one reason, of course, why you know I feel that uh, your uh, college is home to me is because uh, Varsha is a very sweet little younger sister to me. And the second reason is I have visited your college, and I have also, you know, I, I keep coming across uh, your students everywhere, and the wonderful way that your teachers are shaping you. Uh, makes you a very, very pleasurable uh, students to interact with. You are budding academics, and I know that you have a long way to go in academics with the kind of, uh, you know, support that you are getting from your uh, teachers. So uh, there are two reasons why, as I said, therefore, I, I feel it's a kind of homecoming. Uh, I think Varsha has uh, done me, uh, you know, she has given me a very challenging task by giving me this topic, which on the face of it seems quite simple. Uh, on the face of it, it seems, you know, as if, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's a very simple uh, issue. And then again, she complicates it and she frightens me by saying that it is the favorite text of uh, her students. And therefore, uh, her students are uh, you know, impatiently uh, waiting for that. So, uh, you know, it, it is quite a challenge when one tries to talk about Austin. It's quite a challenge when uh, you uh, try to, you know, handle uh, someone as complicated 
uh, someone as deceptively simple as Jane Austen. And uh, well, I, I have decided to take up Varsha's challenge and to talk about uh, the 21st century impressions of Pride and Prejudice. Uh, and I hope it will be a warm and cozy discussion, you know, as, as we talk about it. So uh, uh, if, if you look at Austen and if you look at, you know, Austen's place in uh, the history of uh, uh, the, the rise of the uh, British novel, you realize that the first thing that we as students are taught about Austen is that she's probably one of the first uh, women writers uh, who, who, you know, earned any kind of acclaim uh, in a male dominated scenario. So inevitably, uh, usually uh, a mainstream study of, uh, you know, uh, women's writing uh, begins from Austen. So it is like Austen, uh, followed by, of course, uh, the Bronte sisters, uh, followed by George Eliot. So in a way, Austen appears to us as the major woman writer who begins this trend of uh, you know, fiction writing, which is not the case. Because as a revisionist study of, uh, you know, uh, of history is taking place, you realize that women have largely been a forgotten You know, the, the, the rise of the English novel has been predominantly are these uh, four people, you know, we, we know. Uh, yes, is it audible now, Richard? Is it audible? Yes, Basudi, there was some network issue. Yes. Okay, okay. Fine. So, uh, I won't move from my side. Uh, okay. So, uh, you realize that, uh, you know, the, the, the rise of the novel form, you know, has been a male-dominated area. It is. It has largely been... Uh, a kind of you know male centric narrative so the history of the rise of the british novel has been a male centric narrative that tries to focus on male novelists as being the wheels of the english novel so when we talk about the rise of the english novel we are of course told about you know the industrial revolution that made uh, printing cheaper we are told about the rise of the middle class uh, which offered you know uh, a reading public Mm, uh, which which had purchasing power to buy these novels. Uh, we are told about the, the the rise of coffee houses. You know the culture of the coffee houses where people would sit together and talk about political issues. So we are given uh, an n number of facts that somehow tends to exclude you know the importance of women to the fact of a fiction writing. So today, as as you know, we talk about uh, we talk about a reassessment of uh, pride and prejudice and a reassessment of Austen in general. There are three things that I would be trying to focus. Uh, you know, I, I would be trying to draw your attention to. So the first thing is this: that you know, in the rise of the British novel, you find that women have a very significant contribution to make. It is not the you know male centric narrative that is generally handed down to us uh, in our history classes. So there are uh, there are forgotten histories, there are submerged histories, uh, which we need to pay attention to. So the first thing is this, the importance of women to uh, the establishment of this new genre of the novel form. This would be one area of concern, uh, my first area of concern. Uh, my second area of concern, you know, would be uh, the, the idea of uh, enlightenment and the idea of rationality in the enlightenment. Is it okay? Is there some echo? Is there some echo in the uh, system? No, no, it's fine. Okay. Yes, yes. No, it's fine. Okay, okay. So uh, the, the second idea that I would be exploring is the idea of, you know, the idea of enlightenment, uh, the idea of rationality and how, you know, uh, the enlightenment rationality was uh, posited against the Gothic sentimentality and how in between these two extremes, between the enlightenment rationality and Gothic sentimentality, uh, you know, women are located in between these two. And how, you know, Austin uh, tries to avoid the pitfalls of, you know, belonging to one or the other. And she tries to take a neutral balanced stand against both these excesses. So that my second uh, area of, uh, you know, uh, my second area of exploration or my second area of uh, focus would be this enlightenment rationality versus Gothic uh, sentimentality. 
and uh, third of course we focus through through these two you know readings we will try to understand how jail austen remains uh, was and remains a very potential uh, feminist a very successful feminist in her own way and how pride and prejudice can be read as a feminist novel among among many other possible readings of pride and prejudice we can read it as a novel that uh, you know that of course offers uh, a space to women and it, it it offers a kind of empowerment to women which uh, would would not be at odds given the circumstances that austin was writing in okay so these are the three this would be the three uh, parts of uh, my uh, my talk today so when we talk you know about the rise of the british uh, novel when you see the novel form look look at the word novel now we know that novel means new right so the, the novella coming from french is is something which is new and this is basically you know this would be the semantic uh, you know meaning associated to the novel form the, the the most beautiful thing that could be understood about the novel was that it was a new form it was a new form which was you know establishing itself uh, right from the middle of the 17th century and by the time you come to the 18th century and you realize that the form has come into existence so this is a new form in the sense that it is uh, you know it is kind of uh, it is distinct from the so called classical forms that had predominated uh, english literature so far so the kind of classical forms it, it is not the epic it is not the romance right it, it it is not the drama so what is it it is a prose narrative and uh, you know henry fielding uh, very um, very famously said that it was a comic epic in prose he said that the novel was a comic epic in prose so he was at the same time you know distancing the novel from the epic form and he was also claiming for the novel a similar kind of respect that was associated with the classical epic so the best thing that you should understand about the novel form is that it was a very nascent very new form and it was a very debatable form when it came into existence so there was a lot of debate about the identity of the novel what should you know what should be uh, what should the novel be and what should be the motivation of the novel what should be the aims of the novel and because it is the 18th century you realize that this is a didactic period where literature has to live up to its philosophy of you know promoting moral values in society so it is a didactic age the 18th century a uh, neoclassical period is a didactic period where the value of literature was tested by its ability to morally influence society so the novel had to live up to this moral idea of literature also if it had to create you know a space in uh, the the literature or in the cultural world of the 18th century now this was something which uh, was highly debatable because look at the novels that we begin with you have uh, the first so called formal novel Uh, in english uh, is supposed to be richardson's pamela and look at you know look at pamela so pamela is supposed to be uh, the, the, the subtitle of pamela is that it is it is virtue rewarded so pamela or virtue rewarded and and the very subtitle you know will make the moral position of this novel clear so there is a virtue in the protagonist the, the protagonist of course is pamela she is a woman Uh, there is virtue in her and this virtue is going to be rewarded and when you look at the novel and you examine what kind of a reward does it offer you know uh, you you do not you know you do not seem to agree with it because here you have a a, a girl pamela who is being uh, chased by a man uh, and the man attempts to seduce her in in various ways uh, through various means and when finally you know he fails uh, to to acquire her in that way then he formally and legally proposes marriage to her and because he belongs to a gentlemanly class the marriage is of course supposed to lead to a social mobility for uh, you know pamela who belongs to the working class and therefore the proposal is very readily accepted and the marriage takes place and the end of the novel therefore tells you that you know the, the reward is this marriage that has been made and that has brought about a degree of social mobility for the protagonist now this would by our standards appear as very strange because here we do not see a fulfilling marriage in any respect so a man who had been you know 
disrespectful enough to attempt to seduce a woman uh, what kind of a moral character can one is expect uh, you know from the same man as a marital partner so these are questions which you know richardson brushes aside so pamela you know is 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 written from a very very uh, patriarchal point of view uh, that uh, it, it is patriarchy it is it is the male who defines what what virtue should be in a woman and how that virtue should be safeguarded and protected and then you know what should be the rewards for you know safeguarding and protecting such virtue so uh, you you realize that uh, the, the novel begins with uh what will not be you know far stretched to call the woman question so the woman question which you see in the 19th century which you find appearing maybe in the works of ibsen and shaw and the women suffragette movement in a way you realize that this 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 question about womanhood begins to define itself and begins to come to the forefront with the rise of the novel so the novel offers you know a new genre within which uh, you could talk about uh, social relationships and particularly you could talk about you know what uh, womanhood is entitled to so what are the entitlements of womanhood this is what the novel is questioning uh in contrast to pamela of course in, in defiance of pamela uh, you find that henry fielding he takes up you know uh, the cudgel of satire and he he writes joseph andrews which is supposed to be a kind of uh, satirical response to pamela so here you have the same scenario where things are inverted so instead of a female protagonist you have a male protagonist joseph andrews and he is uh, you know being uh, tempted by a lady and he he kind of words of this temptation uh, so this is a different kind of narrative that fielding brings to the forefront so you read fielding's tom jones and you read fielding's uh, you know joseph andrews and you realize that these are novels which uh, these are works of art which take a strong uh, you know stance in favor of realism so one very important way in which the novel defined itself from its very inception was that it was attempting to be realistic so uh, the novel accepted that the epic and the romance were all fantastic uh, you know they were all fantastic genres they had things to do uh, with the imaginative real with the imaginative world rather than uh, with the reality that was lived and experienced and uh, the novel therefore you know it it claimed a difference by stating that no no i'm i'm not like the epic and the romance and i have my own sphere of investigation and my sphere of investigation is the investigation of social reality so what the novel attempts to do from the very beginning so if you look at you know most of the 18th century novels you know if you have a look at the titles you have a look at the cover pages of how they were published you realize that most of them will claim you know uh, in the cover page that it is a true story so you see robinson crusoe also defoe says that it is a true account you know and gulliver's travels is also a true account and a true history and a true story and lived experience these are words which you will repeatedly find associated with these 18th century novels so the idea was that the novel is going to be a genre which will not talk about ideals it will not talk about how things should be it will rather talk about how things are however when you look at uh, the novels which were written by men at the time you realize that there is a kind of partisanship there is a kind of partiality as far as morality of the novel is concerned so whereas the novel will set out very specific moral parameters for women uh, the same moral parameters do not seem to apply to men so pamela is supposed to retain you know all her virtue and because of uh, this retention she will be rewarded with social mobility at the end so the reward is of economic nature and uh, in order to attain that reward pamela is required to safeguard her virtue however the same principle of virtue does not apply to mr b in the novel so you realize that while on the, there are these are the complexities that we must understand when we look at the rise of the novel form so the novel you know while it is while it claims to be talking about reality it, it is talking about reality as opposed to you know Uh, ideals how things should be so it is not interested in how ideally things should be it is interested in how things are so in how things are at the same time you realize that there is a discrepancy uh, in how things are for men and women so whereas uh, for women there are a set of prescriptions that you know for them uh, things uh, should be like this and this is the model woman you find that the same moral prescriptions do not apply to men 
again, you realize that uh, the, the, the major readers of the novel form were women rather than men. So women, uh, by the time you come to the 18th century, were not very well lettered. They were not very highly educated. But all of them, you know, uh, had a basic a decent education, which would allow them to read something as simple as a novel. So uh, the, the novel, you know, for its particular readership, its particular readership constituted mainly of women. So all these, uh, you know, housewives uh, or all these, uh, you know, young women who were in their homes and who were denied, you will see, a proper formal education via mathematics and philosophy. So these were women who did not have much reading material on their hands except the typical women's magazines that told you how to knit and darn and embroider and all those things. So uh, the novel was a kind of diversion for the majority of women in the 18th century. So the, the, the reading public of this novel would constitute largely of women. And when women began reading, of course, they also began responding. So you realize that the majority of reviews, the critical reviews which were written on the published novels at this point of time were written largely by women. So if you if you if you do a Google search you know, on, on 18th century women novelists, you will come up with a large number of women writers whose names you won't find mentioned in the canonical uh, so-called books, history books, you know, history of English literature. Uh, has has kind of uh, forgotten about a lot of women writers who were not only writing powerful novels, but they were also, you know, very actively commenting on the works of their male counterparts. The works of these women writers, mostly women writers like Afra Ben, you had uh, Frances Burney, you had, uh, you know, Maria H. Worth and, and many of them, many of them. Uh, so you can you can easily find around a mention of anything between ten to uh, twenty, you know, uh, women writers uh, during the eighteenth century who were writing wonderful novels and who, in their novels, attempted to set forth new standards of the gender relationship of the male female relationship. So they were, you know, trying to uh, encode the the frustrations of their time uh, in a way uh, which would, you know appease patriarchy also people would be happy that okay there has been no transgression uh, from the you know from the patriarchal code and at the same time it would be kind it would be a kind of uh, you know a confession of women's particular individual specific experiences in the man's world so you have a host of novels which were being written by women writers you have a host of women writers commenting on the works of their male counterparts and a very common trend you know in 18th century uh, uh, literary uh, criticism is the question about the female consumption of the novel. The idea of female writers and the idea of female readers are two things which you find uh, are, you know, are, are repeatedly under deliberation and discussion uh, in the 18th century. So you have, for example, a critic of the stature of Dr. Johnson, who is convinced that a woman uh, you know, any any decent woman should not read a novel like Tom Jones. And he, he expresses dissatisfaction with the fact, you know, with the fact of a woman who has read and who has written a review on Tom Jones, and she has found Tom Jones to be an appealing character. And uh, Dr. Johnson says that how is it possible? How can a decent uh, woman coming from a good family, how can she even read Tom Jones, let alone enjoy it? So uh, there, there was also this rising opinion that uh, the novel is offering a kind of morality which would, uh, you know, bring about uh, a laxity, which would bring about, uh, which would lead to, you know, uh, false impressions in the women of the times. So somehow there was also this belief that the women had to be policed against the novel form. So either, you know, uh, the, the novel form revises itself, it comes up uh, with more, you know, uh, more patriarchal narratives and where uh, things are, you know, or all indecent things are left out. So either you come up with a novel like that, or, you know, the women should be discouraged from reading and let alone writing novels. So even, you know, I think uh, in, in, in which of these, uh, in one of these works uh, in, in Austin, I believe there is a particular scene uh, where you have uh, the, the protagonist coming and they, they want to read, he wants to read something and there has to be a reading session and uh, a book is taken out and a book is given to him. And uh, the, there Austin says that uh, it, it, is, it, is, it was evident that the book had come from a circulating library. 
and because the book had come from a circulating library it was immediately you know uh, deemed to be you know incapable of being read before women and some other moral uh, you know tract was taken up uh, for the evening's reading so a circulating libraries at that time would be very very popular where uh, you know women could borrow and read novels and could comment on uh, the novels written and their commentaries would also be published in reputed uh, magazines and journals because we know that 18th century was full of these periodicals the dailies and the weeklies and the quarterlies so every uh, you, know, you know each of these periodicals would have its own section where women uh, wrote uh, about uh, works which were uh, published at that time and there was this increasing threat that the novel form you know seemed to pose to uh, the 18th century english morality particularly to the fairer sex the novel posed a threat in that Uh, because it claimed to talk about real reality rather than idealization therefore it was feared that the novel's explorations of reality would kind of let loose all the promiscuity in women and that would be dangerous to the fabric of society so uh, you realize that the novel form was already riddled with a lot of contradictions when it begins and uh, as i said it is not just men who have contributed but more women than men have contributed to the establishment and to the defense of the novel as a legitimate form of literature uh, from this you know we go over to to austen and you realize that when austen comes on the scenario uh, she uh, she takes up a novel writing and uh, the novels that she writes initially are not at all well received her father sends out sense and sensibility to a reputed publisher and it comes back saying that we're not interested in this uh, and then uh, twice or thrice austen has suffered rejection before finally she uh, she publishes uh, sense and sensibility and pride and prejudice you know with her own money so that the first publication is uh, with with austen spending money and because of course she did not belong to a very well off family her father was a clergyman Uh, and uh, they did not have a lot of finances therefore there's a lot of hesitation involved in this and 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 austens uh, you know publication expenses are financed by her uh, brother and sister in law and that is how she manages to get published and then when she manages to get published and her novels and and when you you read the original you look at the original cover you know of austens uh, novels and the original cover of sense and sensibility says that this is a novel which is written by a woman so the, the first publication you know was anonymous uh, but austen makes it amply clear that the writer here is a woman so very uh, you know in, in very clean and bold letters the cover of sense and sensibility announces that this is a novel written by a woman now you contrast this with what the bronte sisters and later mary ann evans were doing in the same period so the bronte sisters were all using male pseudonyms to uh, you know to publish their works uh mary ann evans wrote under the pen name of george eliot which was a masculine name so you have austen before them who very boldly proclaims that her novels are written by a woman so doesn't that you know uh doesn't that uh, make it evident that austen wanted this woman sensibility her sensibility as a female writer to stand at the forefront of the reception of her novels she wanted the reception of her novels to be framed by the idea that she was a woman writer because when she was anonymously publishing she need not have included the idea that uh, you know this is this was a novel written by a woman she could simply have left the novel uh, to its fate in the book market but she does not do this also knowing that her identity as a woman could uh, somehow limit uh, the perception of her work knowing that there were prejudices to her being published as a woman writer because already you find you know the women the women writers in austen's time they had begun to acquire some kind of a commercial success though not an artistic success so they were not writers who were claimed as good writers by so called reviewers and so called literary magazines of the era but then these women you know women like maria edgeworth women like afra ben they were making a lot of money as writers so this is perhaps for the first time in history that women as writers are not only writing but also making money out of what they write so jane austen by choosing to be published as a woman writer you know tries to uh, you know tries to place herself in this tradition of writing and publishing women 
so she is not you know she is not interested in being published under a male pseudonym she is not interested in any confusion about the authorship of her works it does not matter to her that uh, she be known as jane austen but it does matter to her that these works be known as having been written by a female uh, you know by a woman writer so uh, you realize that austen gets published you know uh, she she self publishes in a way so and and then the uh, the contract is that if if her copies sell uh, some amount of money will return to her and then of course her copies begin to sell sense and sensibility uh, acquires a reasonable success in 1811 sense and sensibility is published uh, followed by uh, in 1813 uh, the, the publication of pride and prejudice and then you have uh, you know you have uh, emma coming up you have mansfield park so the four novels uh, that is uh, sense and sensibility pride and prejudice mansfield park and emma all these four novels were published during austen's lifetime uh, she unfortunately died very young as was uh, very very common for women of that time Uh, so she died at the age of 39, and the, the two other novels, that is uh, *Not Angel Abbey* and *Persuasions*, uh, they were published posthumously. They were published after she died, and then you realize that uh, Austen's uh, reputation was kind of uh, okay. It was kind of mediocre in Austen's time. She she acquired popularity, and before the publication of *Emma*, in fact, uh, she had a note written to her that the Prince Regent, that is, uh, you know, uh, the Prince George. Uh, he was interested in her works and he would like emma to be dedicated to him and though austen was never really interested in that kind of a fame uh, being the very uh, reclusive individual that she was we see that austen uh, dedicates emma to the prince regent and uh, and i think uh, that becomes her last published work uh, before she dies so look at the trend that uh, you know uh, that that takes place in austen's criticism so austen dies a, a relatively less known writer not many people know about austen in her own times so she she is published she is i think uh, the exact sums that she derives from the sales of uh, sense and sensibility and pride and prejudice for pride and prejudice i remember she gets back 1 120 pounds 120 pounds she had expected at least 150 but she gets 120 and she is more or less reasonably satisfied that her book has done well so uh, just imagine that austen has to spend her own money on publication in, in her in her time and she gets back an amount of uh, 120 pounds uh, for uh, you know for writing the novel as the sales proceeds uh, from that novel and this austen today has become an industry in herself So look at Jane Austen today. Jane Austen today is literally a brand. Jane Austen is revered worldwide as a brand. So you you attach Austen to anything, and you find that in the West particularly, it sells like hotcakes. So the first movie that was made out of Jane Austen's works, I think *Pride and Prejudice*, was first serialized by the BBC, you know, in a 300-hour episode format, and it won so much appreciation that it was telecast later in the United States. And from 1995, steadily, you realize that Austen's works have been gaining in prestige. Today, you have Austen tours. You have Austen Austen heritage tours, where you know you pay a certain sum of money and you. were taken on a tour to the places where austen visited to the places where she lived in to the place where she wrote you have an austen museum which is preserving you know whatever articles that she had so look at how austen is an industry in herself uh, apart from all the you know very famous films that have been made and that we know of so the the, the major mainstream movies that have been made on austen's novels on pride and prejudice on sense and sensibility on emma on not angel park on not angel abbey you realize that for every one good movie that has claimed your attention there are at least a 10 or a dozen bad ones so there are bad movies also being made which do not draw the public attention which does not come as far as you know as this part of the this part of the world but the point is austen has become such a cult figure today that there is absolutely uh, probably no reader who does not own at least one copy of jane austen's novels in fact in a recent survey you know uh, pride and prejudice was the third you know best owned novel by people so the first uh, novel uh, that was popularly owned was of course uh, jk rowling's harry potter series and then it was followed by uh, by i i i forget exactly which particular novel 
uh, Da Vinci Code. Yes, it was followed by the Da Vinci Code. And the third novel, you know, that hit the list at number three for being the most owned novel across the world was Pride and Prejudice. So look at, you know, the cult figure that Austen has become. And there are so many labels. So it, it is uh, the it is Austenism and it is, uh, you know, Jainism. And there are so many, you know, brands that have built around Austen. Now, how has this happened? And how do we read then? How do we, uh, uh, you know, place Jane Austen in the midst of all this glamour? Uh, when we read or when we look at a cultural artifact that bears the name of Austen or that bears the legacy of Austen, what exactly? Exactly, are we dealing with? These are questions that come to mind because no woman writer, you know, has been so glorified as Jane Austen has. Of course, there have been critics who believe, you know, there have been male critics who have stated from time to time that Austen's art bears uh, close resonances with the art of Shakespeare. Uh, there, are, there have been uh, critics who have compared Austen to Shakespeare. And yet, you know, we realize that when we deal with Austen, uh, we we must uh, you know we must do some amount of critical sifting. We have to do some critical sifting uh, to to separate the grain from the chaff and to understand exactly uh, what we see when we see Austen's popularity. So you look at as I said, look at the period when Austen dies and she dies a, a, a hardly known or a less known novelist, and then you realize that in, in the Victorian period. Uh, you have her novels being republished by a good publisher. So all her six novels together are published as a box set by a good publisher. And uh, because it is coming from a good publishing house, therefore, you know, there is a there is a renewed interest and there are greater sales. And then you have the most important work that shaped Austen's posthumous fame is the biography that Austen's own nephew, you know, Austen's own nephew wrote a biography, a memoir on her life. And that one memoir went a long way to both build Austen's reputation as also, you know, to deflect attention from it. So you have, you know, Austen's uh, elder brother's son, so James Lay Austen. He comes up with a memoir of his aunt, Jane Austen, in the year, I guess, it is 1869, 1869, 1870 is when, you know, of his aunt. And what exactly is uh, this fellow, uh, James Austen, trying to do? He is, of course, trying to remember his aunt. But then we must remember that his aunt died when this boy was 19 years old. He, uh, Jane Austen had already died when her nephew was around 19 years old. And these memories, uh, this particular book, you know, uh, the, the memoir of Jane Austen is being written when this fellow has retired from service. So he's in his middle ages and he is, you know, thinking back upon a time when he was 19. And on the basis of such memories, he's writing a memoir. And this memoir, you know, projects Austen as a very, very homely domestic figure who falls into, you know, who falls in with the Victorian conception of womanhood. So if you, if you look at the Victorian age, you realize that femininity and womanhood in the Victorian period were defined by the ideal of the so-called angel in the house, right? So the, the angel in the house was a very famous poem by a man named Coventry Patmore, who felt that, you know, his, his wife was an angel in the house. And, and this poem became so popular and it spoke about women being very soft influences on man. So the, the Victorian period was one period which, uh, which emphasized upon the segregation of social spheres. So, you know, a uh, woman for the home, a woman for the hearth and man for the you know, field. Hmm? So uh, this, this idea that Tennyson introduces is, a, is an idea that characterizes the entire thinking of the Victorian period. So the Victorian period was characterized by strict segregation of spheres. The woman, you know, was equally important. She was very important. You cannot negate her importance. But then she's important only as far as her home and her domestic territory is concerned. And then, of course, the man uh, is, is the lord of the social space. He's the lord of the public space. And when he comes home, you know, he, he gets tired. He gets tired in this public space. He gets exhausted in this public space. And therefore, when he comes home, it is the woman's duty to kind of rejuvenate him and to cheer him up and to offer him all, you know, the feminine graces and uh, to, to build a softer. So she's supposed to be a shelter uh, to the tired and burnout man who is sick from his, you know, 
uh, social uh, obligations and social interactions. So this typical idea of women being caregivers, of women being, you know, positive, uh, soft, gentle influences on men. This was an idea which the Victorians held on to, you know, and they cherished it completely. And this was their typical idea of femininity. So the typical Victorian woman, the, the admired Victorian woman, would be uh, an angel in the house who would have no ambitions for herself. She would be entirely ambitionless, an angelic creature who would continuously be attending to others. And this is exactly the image that, uh, you know, James Austin Lay offers of his aunt to us. So he tells us that Austin was a very, very, uh, you know, comfortable, uh, unambitious woman who wrote because she was interested in writing, but she was quite apologetic about what she wrote. So uh, this biography, this memoir, you know, gives us accounts of how she would punctuate her writing with all her domestic work. So she would be darning and she would be knitting and she would be weaving and she would be crocheting and embroidering and putting things in order. And in the middle of this, she would also do some writing on small scraps of paper. And uh, there is this uh, very famous anecdote that comes out from the book that Austin lived in a large household surrounded by uh, brothers and their wives and nephews and nieces. And she would hardly have what Virginia Woolf would later call a room of her own. So she would hardly have a room of her own. And uh, her entire writing, uh, you know, uh, writing schedule or her entire writing interest would be conducted in tandem with her duties as a responsible householder. And uh, she would write and whenever she would, you know, hear people coming into the room and there would be the sound of people, she would immediately put her uh, writing, put her sheaf of papers, bundle them together and put them under the cover of the sofa. Uh, in which she happened to sit. So the sofa was a very uh, comfortable hiding place for Austin, where Austin often hid her manuscripts. So the idea that emerges is not of a woman writer who is committed to writing. The, the idea, the impression that emerges from a study of, uh, you know, uh, Austin's, uh, James Austin's memoir, is that his aunt was a woman who was interested in writing, but who was quite apologetic about it. She did not want to come out into the open with it. So she, she did it mostly, you know, clandestine. It was a clandestine activity, her writing. She was not really very interested in getting published. Uh, she had no uh, kind of uh, motivations or she had no ambitions in being a writer. So writing happened by chance to her. So this is the impression of Austin that uh, the memoir builds. And believe me, the memoir became very popular, leading to a radical upsurge in uh, Austin's prestige and fame as a writer. So the Victorians, you know, embraced with so much of affection a, a, a woman who had by chance become a writer, who was not really interested in writing, and who uh, paid attention to all her domestic duties before she wrote a single line. So such a wonderful woman, you know, was to be admired, she was to be respected, she was to be cherished. And that is the point where you find that a steady rise begins in Austin's prestige. In fact, the rise is so steady, uh, people take to Austin, you know, uh, in, in such a dramatic way that you find uh, in the same century, you find at the, uh, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, you find that D.H. Lawrence d d begins to detest Jane Austen. And he says that Jane Austen is, is an old maid who does not have any idea of the world. And look at what she writes. She writes about apartness rather than about togetherness. She does not know the joy of togetherness. Why? Because she was a spinster. She never married herself. She died an old maid. She had no idea about romance and romantic attachments. And such a woman can hardly write, uh, you know, appealing romantic fiction. So Austen uh, is deemed by D.H. Lawrence as an old maid uh, who knows more about apartness and therefore who can never explore togetherness in her works. Now, do you think that a conscientious reading of Austen's novels would merit a kind of criticism like this? It is very difficult to realize that uh, or, or to believe that a woman who wrote Pride and Prejudice, or a writer, forget a woman, a writer who wrote Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility and Emma would not know, you know, what togetherness was. So uh, what I want to uh, draw to your attention is that these ideas which became very popular about Austen were not about Austen the woman who lived. They were about Austen as they were constructed in this memoir by her nephew. 
Now her nephew, of course, was a was a Victorian man, and he was interested in securing two things. He was interested in securing a, a family legacy for himself. So it would be good for him to be called, uh, uh, you know, the, the nephew of uh, a writer as established as Jane Austen. So he was partly doing it to consolidate the family legacy. He was also partly doing it to kind of, you know. Uh, condone hmm, to kind of pardon to kind of achieve accomplish a pardon for his aunt on behalf of the various disturbing characters that his aunt had created so you look at uh, you know austin's corpus and while almost every critic says of austin that she's very polished and she's very genteel and she's very delicate and she's very balanced she knows exactly where to stop she never offends right there is nothing vulgar about austin so austin in every way is supposed to characterize the typical british you know sensibility the british sensibility of balance the british sensibility of decorum the british sensibility of respectability so these are ideas which Austin is believed to have upheld and yet you know you find that there are uh, facts in austin's novels which are very disturbing how could uh, you know a woman who is uh, so bent on respectability and on gentility and on balance talk so openly about money in her novels so in a way there are many critics today who say that uh, jane austen was a marxist before marx arrived on the scene so what marx talks about almost a century later you know or at least uh, uh, at least half a century later, Austin is talking about all those things very openly uh, in a dialogic form in her novels. So she is exactly, you know, bringing things down to the very basics. How much money does it take to run a household? How much money does it take to assure a good marriage? How much dowry should a girl have to win a man's attention? How much property should a man have to in turn uh, draw a girl's attention? So these are things which Austen very openly discusses in her novels. And there is not one novel of Jane Austen where you will not find discussions of money coming in. So how could a woman who is supposed to be so respectable and so gentle and so delicate and such an angel in the house that she has no idea of the outside world who was not very well read and who did not travel at all so how could a woman like this write like this this is something which disturbs us again look at characters for example look at if, if since we're doing pride and prejudice look at characters like mr collins who, who is openly you know laughed at openly satirized openly ridiculed by austin so a man uh, a successful man a man of the world and that to a clergyman is being, you know, uh, ridiculed by Austin and she does it and she carries it very flamboyantly. Look at a character like Charlotte who says that, fine, you know, in marriage we should not expect much and the least we know about each other's uh, faults before marriage, the better it is for a happy marriage. So in any marriage, chances uh, of happiness, you know, are highly subjective or highly variable. So there are, there is no way where a happy marriage can be secured. Look at that. So this departs from the romantic idea uh, that has prevailed all throughout the 18th and the 19th century that love leads to marriage. So uh, I, I don't remember who, but someone said that love and marriage go together like horse and carriage. So uh, if, if you know there is a horse, there has to be a carriage. And if there is love, there has to be a marriage. And they go together. Now look at how wonderfully Austin challenges the idea of love being important for a marriage. Love is not at all important for a marriage, as Charlotte tells us. Now, of course, Austen does not follow Charlotte's destiny to the end. So we do not know whether she lives a happy life or she does not. But uh, the point is Charlotte is brave enough to choose a man like Mr. Collins without caring for uh, marital or domestic happiness is a big thing. Don't, don't you feel that it is very modern that what Austen does uh, is, you know, is quite at odds with the belief that uh, we tend to harbor about her. So the received critical opinion is that she's a very uh, delicate woman uh, who was largely confined to the house and who had very little knowledge of the world. And therefore, because she had very little knowledge of the world, she's not at all talking about the major events that uh, you know, impact the social world of her times. So she's not talking about the you know, French Revolution and she's not talking about uh, whatever is happening in England as a result of the French Revolution. So these are things that she, she appears to be completely silent on, unlike uh, George Eliot, who's talking, of course, about the Reform Bill and about how you know, industrialization has changed uh, Victorian society. So 
questions uh, subject material is one uh, you know one important uh, factor which has led people to brand her as a closeted writer so she she by her own you know admission she says that no i'm not interested in uh, very large things so what interests me is a few families uh, you know in a country setting so i'm satisfied with that my story can build itself very well from a study of a few families uh, together now look at what was meant by the idea of family in austen's time so austen you know Uh, in, in talking about a family, she was not just talking about a few individuals. She was also talking about the politics of uh, families. Uh, she was also talking about the socio-cultural, economic politics of the times that underlined relationships between individuals in a family and also between families in a neighborhood. So when Austen said that her subject matter is just a few families in a countryside people tend to kind of uh, you know write it off as being uh, very domestic and being very closeted and as having uh, no references to the outer world at large however uh, this is not uh, what we find in austen's novels so uh, i i said that i would be concentrating in the second part i would be concentrating on how you know uh, this 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 idea the the idea that uh, you know uh, the the enlightenment generated about rationality how that idea plays a very important role in austen's novels and that will also uh, try to help us to understand how austen was a feminist you know in her individual way and also in her circumstantial way given the circumstances that uh, she was writing and given the society that she was writing in she needed to uh, secure empowerment for her women and how does austen you know empower her women uh, would be something which would be exclusively uh, depending upon uh, austen's particular society so to begin with you realize that women in austen's times were forced into marriage they were forced into marriage because of the peculiar economics of the time so look at you know look at this how is a woman expected to survive now a woman can uh, can survive uh, through money uh, so money can be earned by a woman uh but how can a woman earn money because you begin with the fact that educational opportunities are already limited for women so women are not given uh, equal opportunities of education with men uh, the education which is prescribed for women is of a, a very distinct and of a very specific nature so women uh, are not taught trades that will help them find a place in the world so educationally women are crippled they do not have good educational opportunities look at employment opportunities again when it comes to employment there are not sufficient employment opportunities for women you realize that in austen times uh, women would at best you know be employed either as nurses or governesses and both these you know both these employments both these professions were looked down upon when it came to women of the genteel class when it came to women of the so called respectable class so people or women belonging to respectable classes did not work as governesses did not work as nurses then what did women do women could of course have thrived through money which they inherited say from rich parents but even here you find that this becomes very problematic for austen's women because the laws in england you know the legal framework that austen was writing under you find that there are two factors which influence women's uh, you know inheritance of property one is of course primogeniture I, i'll just type this out for you so you have uh, just a second you have uh, primogeniture and you have you know what you know as covered pure so primogeniture and covered pure are two ways you know are, are two uh, ideas that inhibited uh, you know austens uh, Austen's women. So the the idea of primogeniture it 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 ensured that the property of a family would pass on to the eldest male heir of the family. So if a family had say five sons, the property would only you know go go on to the uh, eldest son because because Jane Austen's time was a feudal setup where they did not believe in you know dividing a piece of land into many bits. So the land had to be passed on intact so as to you know so as the legacy for the family to continue. so they did not believe in uh, you know mixed ownership and therefore the the law of primogeniture prevailed by which the entire property would pass on to the eldest male heir now say uh, if if there were no males then what would happen to a family 
for example, examine the Bennett family in Pride and Prejudice, they have no brothers at all. So what happens in the case of family property to a family like this? So the property then is going to be entailed, you know, to the next male in line. So this next male in line could be anybody from the extended family. And there was no guarantee that once the property passed on to that male, he would, you know, assume responsibility for the dependent females of the family from which he has received the property. So this is the situation that befalls, uh, you know, the Bennett family as well. So the Bennett's are five sisters and none of them are going to inherit, you know, their father's property. And the state of Longbourn is going to pass on from the Bennett family on to Mr. Collins, who is the next male cousin in their line. And there is no guarantee, as Mr. Bennett says, that Mr. Collins, you know, will be good enough to assume responsibility of the six women in the Bennett family if these daughters are not well married before their father dies. So you look at this from this perspective that there is no other option available to a woman to ensure survival. She cannot inherit property. She cannot, you know, get educated. She cannot get a job. Then what does she do in order to survive? Now, of course, women could, you know, uh, have, they could have articles. They could be given uh, small sums of money as allowances. And that was how, you know, uh, women had some kind of a property in that, but they, they never they never had access to landed property. They could never acquire landed property and, you know, they could never own very large sums of money. Say a woman owned a large sum of money, this sum of money, you know, in the event of her marriage, would go straight to her husband. So this was the idea of coverture. The idea of coverture, you know, it, it saw man and woman, man and wife as one legal entity. So whatever money a woman brought as part of her dowry or as part of her, you know, uh, savings or inheritance, whatever, would straight away pass on to her husband. And the husband was under no obligation, you know, to return this in the event of a divorce or in the event of a misunderstanding or even in the event of the husband running away and marrying someone else. So uh, primogeniture and covert peer were important, you know, um, uh, legal terms in Austin's days, which inhibited the economic freedom of women. And women, therefore, had no option but to get, you know, well married. Now, well married, well would be a very controversial adjective here. What is well married? And this is perhaps the entire area of Austin's inquiry in fiction. She takes it for granted that women have to get married. There is no other option but for them to get married. But then how do they get well married is a question. So this question takes Austin to various directions. And you find if you look at all her novels, there are, there are a multiplicity of equations that offer themselves. So do, does one get married you know, on the basis of money? Does the one get married on the basis of emotional attachments? Does one get married on the basis of you know, uh, you know, uh, prosaic reasons uh, such as uh, you know, uh, wealth? Hmm? So what, what is the key to uh, you know, uh, a good match? And how can a good match be socially fulfilling? These are questions that Austin tries to answer through her fiction. And this, you know, this particular subject matter, it establishes Austin as a very uh, prude and as a very orthodox uh, woman writer of her times. But if you look at it, you know, from the angle of modern feminism, uh, you see that Austin is uh, endorsing uh, marriage. She's endorsing a heterosexual relationship. She is endorsing uh, the kind of power structure, the hierarchy that a marital relationship will you know, bring along with it. But you realize that Austin does not have an option in the times that she is writing. Uh, Austin would probably have had no idea of homosexuality. There are, uh, you know, there are researchers, there have been researchers which try to examine uh, the relationship between uh, the female characters in Austin from a queer perspective. Uh, but these are, you know, simply inquiries and conjectures and critical debates that we can engage in. As far as Austin's writing was concerned, uh, she was at best, you know, trying to give women a space in her fiction. So simply by, uh, you know, uh, making her central protagonists women, she is uh, ensuring for them a kind of fictional space that, uh, you know, a male uh, novelist would not have given them. So her novels are exclusively uh, women-centric, we say. And that itself, I think, uh, would qualify for Austen's uh, feminist concerns, that she is talking about women in an age when women are largely marginalized. So she, she has the courage 
to base an entire novel on the uh, you know the development the self development of a woman so if you look at all of austen's novels you realize that they are all buildings from a narrative they are all self development narratives where you know the 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 female the central female protagonist is proceeding from ignorance to knowledge now this journey this buildings from a you know this 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 journey of self evolution was supposed to be essentially a masculine journey only a male you know uh, can make this uh, journey uh, from ignorance to knowledge only a male will have, will have the right uh, to explore himself and uh, you know to give way to this uh, development uh, so you know austen by allowing her women protagonists to uh, go on an intellectual journey to go on an existential journey to explore and bring about and you know contribute and be agents of their own growth and development is in itself i believe a feminist idea so women in austen's novels uh, her protagonists at least her central protagonists are all agents you see they are not you know simply at the receiving end of things they are agents who kind of work to uh, improve and to uh, make a way for themselves in the world so whatever limitations they have you know within that they seek the best so this is one key concern again you look at austen's uh, sensibility the sensibility of austen's women uh, here i would like to draw your attention to what i was talking about you know uh, enlightenment rationalism so the 18th century was a uh, was a period which you know which which um, preferred rationalism or which preferred reason over you know sentiments and emotions and the imagination so the, the 18th century stood for you know rationality for balance for you know sense over imagination and sensibility so you realize that by the time you come to the uh, the second half of the 18th century there begins to be a turn towards romanticism and the gothic you know as a genre it it establishes itself within these closing years of the 18th century and within the gothic novel you find that uh, you know uh, uh, the romanticism which is going to resurface in a big way in the next century that already makes its appearance and you have an extremes of emotions within these gothic novels so you have very passionate characters and very whimsical characters uh, who seem to act solely you know uh, uh, considering the individual as a unit so for these gothic characters you know the individual is a unit is the axis of thought and not the society as the 18th century uh, writers had been want to establish when you look at austen you realize that austen is trying to rectify this imbalance that has taken place and she is trying to question you know uh, the idea and the emotion of love which has become so centric in the gothic romance so what is love is is what austen is questioning and she's trying to find out whether love is merely uh, something that takes place in the imagination or whether love you know manifests itself through duty and through action and through a response and through communication in the everyday world and of course austen settles in the favor of this of the latter she says that love is not what expresses itself you know uh, in in random emotions or love is not that uh, which two people uh, you know uh, fantasize about love is that which can you know translate emotions in a social context so you find in pride and prejudice that uh, elizabeth and darcy in order to uh, find uh, love in one another they need to first you know uh, come into communication as individuals so communication is a, is a big factor in austen's novels all her characters are trying to communicate and in communication you know they uh, they they realize their own weaknesses they also realizes realize the weakness of the people in front of them and through this dialogue through this communication things are worked out and they improve so it is more an improvement which stands at the core of a successful relationship is what austen believes so her ideas you know may be rejected by postmodernists who believe that of course there is nothing absolutely good and nothing absolutely bad uh, but in austen's time you know this 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 return to a, a kind of balance was very important given uh, the the excesses of romanticism that were taking place so on the one hand you know the entire french revolution was the result of the excesses of romanticism and it came to nothing so there was a fear that uh, you know an, an excess of romanticism an excess of imagination an excess of sensibility could kind of uh, handicap our day to day social living and we had to you know try to preserve that social fabric so austen's best you know heroines are all uh, those who hold on to the enlightenment ideal of rationality they're all rational creatures and if there is any hint of you know 
sentimentality in them uh, that has to be cured before they can be given or granted a good destiny by the novelist so you find that emma has to be cured you find that elizabeth has to be cured before she can you know be rewarded through a marriage with darcy again you realize that austen uh, talks about home and she talks about home not merely with reference to her women but also with reference to her men so her best heroes are heroes who are interested in the domestic sphere so you look at darcy darcy is the owner of a large state and uh, you know he he proves himself as eligible for uh, elizabeth when he can go beyond his own pride and when he can you know uh, take a part in managing domestic affairs so he manages you know the lydia wickham affair uh, he also uh, you know looks after the people who are there in his own state uh, in the state of pemberley and it is uh, darcy's engagement in the domestic sphere which uh, claim for darcy Uh, the position of the hero in the novel and that is why darcy is the protagonist and not you know uh, mr bingley who was initially introduced to us so when when characters are initially introduced it is bingley who draws attention and darcy is a secondary figure and from there darcy rises up to be the protagonist of the novel to be the male uh, protagonist the hero of the novel and this has this is you know austen's idea that the domestic sphere is a sphere which is not just left to the woman both men and women are equally to contribute to it which is why she makes fun of you know mr bennet in the novel so you find that mr bennet is least interested uh, you know in, in in whatever happens to his daughters so he feels that his his daughters are extremely silly women and and he does not feel any responsibility to cure their silliness so austen repeatedly emphasizes that the home is a space you know which is not just allotted to the woman but it's, it's also allotted to the man and the man who makes uh, an attempt to be at home in this space to make the home a better place is the kind of individual that her heroines should prefer so this would also you know uh, place austen uh, in the category of uh, a feminist because this is what even modern day feminists are talking about we we of course talk about it Uh, on on more uh, you know sophisticated terms we talk about a distribution of domestic labor and we talk about men's roles in child care now of course austen had not uh, acquired that level of uh, you know uh, division of labor uh, in her uh, own times but yes she is talking about um, the home being an equitable space between man and women and and, and both you know should uh, assume control and assume responsibility for the family so uh, these ideas have gone a long way in shaping uh, austens uh, the new scholarship that is being generated on austen so we need to break out from the framework that austen was uh, was a woman of very limited perceptions and she did not travel much and she did not know much about the world there has to be a questioning of you know this biographical data and the image that had for a long period uh, you know Uh, in head in our imagination that she was a woman who was by chance a writer should not be true given that she died when she was 39 and she has written you know between 1800 uh, say 1800 to in the in, 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 in around you know 20 to 25 years she has written six wonderful novels uh, given the difficult circumstances of her life the way when her father died the entire family had to move uh, they became quite impoverished you know after their father died so given all these problems it, it is not uh, easy for us to understand how you know austen could consistently be a very satisfied a very complacent uh, angel in the house so we we there there has to be a revisionist study there are studies going on and we need to understand that austen uh, should not be understood as a woman who limited herself to her 6 inches of ivory simply because she was talking about uh, you know very simple things no in these simple things also she is uh, she has a microcosm that focuses on social political and uh, you know uh, economic issues of her day economics particularly is a key driver in austen's fictions and uh, i think uh, this is all that i had to say i have also taken a considerable period of your time Uh, i would be now happy to invite questions if you have this varsha uh, you are you know you can conduct a question answer session uh, for your students if you wish uh, yes basudi thank you very much for the very rich session uh, so without any delay i would now invite the questions which you have students please post your questions or unmute yourself and ganishta has a question ganishta you could unmute yourself and ask your question 
good afternoon good evening ma'am yes ma'am my question is as austin nephew in his memoir writes that austin didn't have that much of exposure she was happy in her household life and she was interested in writing but not dedicated to write and at the same time we come to know that her first published book was self finance isn't it contradictory yes this is what you know this is what i i wanted to draw attention to that uh, her, her self financing probably indicates two things the first thing is that uh, women in austen's period uh, you know they were uh, they were held in suspicion as writers so because she had chosen to advertise her work as a novel written by a woman maybe that was one reason why the novel failed to catch the eyes of a good publisher maybe that was why uh, you know the bronte sisters and george eliot chose to publish under male pseudonyms so uh, as far as the self publishing part of it is concerned uh, we cannot say much Uh, there were of course constraints of the times but as far as the image that uh, you know james austen lay has built up in his memoir this image has uh, been uh, the kind of a framework for austen criticism for uh, the major part of the 19th and 20th century uh, for the major part of the 20th century where austen was considered to be a non serious writer who has achieved fame by chance so it was a kind of victorian reconstruction of austen it was not you know a biography of austen it was a victorian resurrection of austen and that victorian resurrection became very important for austen's popularity later on though of course the popularity led to a great deal of misunderstanding also about the actual import and the actual importance of her works do you get that ganishtha does it satisfy you thank you ma'am yes yes ma'am ma'am okay any more questions yes, I have one more thing. I thought about. Yes, Mr. Santini. Santini. Ma'am, can we say that Austen is the first female writer, or among the first female writer, who really defines the concept of marriage? Because before her, the concept of marriage was something slavish. A woman has to be a doll in a house. But her yes. concept uh, of marriage gives. new idea to the community yes you know you you look at uh, a very famous uh, you know uh, the one of the most important uh, you know founder uh, you know founder founding members of the feminist movement you have mary wollstone craft who was uh, for some years a contemporary of jane austen and you look at uh, mary wollstone craft's novels she has left behind two novels Uh, one of them is unfinished the wrongs of a woman is unfinished and i think a uh, mary a fiction uh, is her finished work and you look at the way that you know uh, because mary wollstone craft was a confessed and a professed feminist so you look at the kind of destiny that wollstone craft's heroines have so wollstone craft's heroines you know they reject the idea of marriage they do not want to be uh, married to anybody that would be the you know worst kind of destiny uh, that wollstone craft feels should come to a woman so they the uh, wolfson crafts heroines they reject marriage uh, but if they reject marriage what happens to them do they live happy lives and you realize that they do not so one of the heroines you know she ends up as almost insane and uh, the another heroine she ends up on the verge of contemplating death so she may you know at the end of the novel i mean after the end of the novel she may uh, you know do suicide we do not know we have no way of knowing so the point is that wollstone craft's heroines have the courage to reject uh, you know the patriarchal uh, destiny of marriage but in return for that you know in rejecting that what alternative do they have they have the alternative of living the life of a shell of living the life of of a heroic failed uh, misunderstood abused hurt broken woman now this is not the kind of fate that austen wants for her women she says that fine if marriage is what uh, you know we have uh, we uh, have an entitlement to uh, fine let us do this you know uh, flamboyantly if marriage is what we should be doing uh, let us do this happily let us do this flamboyantly and let us do this on our own terms why should you know we be dictated 
uh, as to what makes a good marriage. Let us explore what makes a good marriage. So Austin, you know, could easily have crafted uh, heroines like Wollstonecraft's heroines, but Wollstonecraft's heroines they do not uh, offer a healthy alternative to rejecting marriage. If they reject marriage, they end up suffering. You know, they end up misunderstood. They end up uh, away from every kind of happiness. Now Austin wants her women to be materially happy. All her girls, you will see, they choose material happiness, and even when they choose love, you know, uh, the love comes with material happiness. You do not find any of Austin's women making wrong choices in marriage, uh, as far as economy is concerned. No. So even you know, uh, Lydia and Wickham, they get married to one another when uh, Darcy can assure them of a reasonable, uh, you know. Sum of uh, money, so they have a reasonable inheritance coming from him, and then only they can get married. Similarly, Charlotte, she marries. She may not have love, but she has money. Uh, similarly, Austen and uh, you know Elizabeth, when they marry, they may have love, but love comes with the money. So Austen is very very concerned about her characters as far as the economics is concerned. So she wants the economics of a of a relationship should be in, intact, and this economics should of course be buttressed by. Emotions should be buttressed by a healthy appreciation and respect for each other. So, in this way, she is also kind of, you know, uh, before the Victorians come up with the segregation of the sexes, she is coming uh, into the idea of a communication between the sexes. She is talking of a gender dialogue. So, all her, you know, uh, heroes and heroines before they get married, there is a good deal of dialogue between them, which I find very similar, you know. to uh, what has been uh, portrayed in the restoration play the way of the world so in the way of the world you realize that the the, the hero and the heroine are rebel and element they are coming together to discuss what a marriage should be they are coming together to prepare a contract for marriage and though austens uh, heroines and heroes do not exactly go to that extent of establishing a contract but yes they are entering into a communication into a discourse about what being together will mean so it is not as if they are jumping to marriage straight away so this is uh, i think a good observation that you have made that she was one of the first uh, you know uh, fiction writers uh, who were who was trying to draw attention to the institution of marriage now marriage for austin is not an individual thing you see it's not a relationship it is an institution it is an institution where two people will come together have a home have children and then those children have to be well brought up Now, if the marriage is incompatible, like the Bennet marriage, you see, we are told that Mrs. Bennet was capable of engaging Mr. Bennet's uh, affections at a very early age, and then he could not see through, you know, through the, through the, you know, the meanness of her character. He gets married, and as a result, when he, when he knows his wife closely, he dislikes her, and now there is no way in which this relationship can be rebuilt. So he has almost given up any interest in household affairs. and the girls are all left to their own ends so the two elder daughters jane and elizabeth they are in close contact with their uncle and aunt mr and mrs gardiner and therefore you know they have received some positive values from their uncle and aunt whereas the other three sisters you know are left to fend for themselves so marriage for austin is not a relationship it is an institution where two people have to go a long way it has to begin in a marriage and it has to end you know in a happy and a respectable family unit So this is what I think Austen is trying to educate uh, women of her period in this way. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, do we have other questions? Yes, uh, we have one more question from Amrit Mishra. Yes, yes, I can read it here. So he says that is Elizabeth Elizabeth's choice of Darcy not affected by the visit to the Darcy's home? Yes, exactly. It is. This is what I want to point out. this is what i said that when we say that jane austen you know is is a uh, is a genteel respectable lady who is not bothered about the ways of the world and she is writing in a closet and this is an image which is uh, militated by a close observation of a text so you realize that uh, you know elizabeth's decision to uh, rethink darcy to reevaluate darcy's proposal comes after her visit to pemberley so when she goes to pemberley she is kind of Uh, you know shocked by uh, she is kind of uh, you know taken uh, aback by the immense splendor of the state so it's a beautiful state and she realizes that to be the mistress of pemberley would be something so pemberley in a way uh, you know it kind of disarms elizabeth she's drawn into it and then you know that is an important reason perhaps why she wants to reevaluate this proposal that darcy had offered her in the past and that she had rejected initially 
so that is what i want to say that for for you know austin's women it is not just marriage she wants to ensure that the economics and the emotions of marriage remain intact and here i think economics outweighs the scale now you know if you if you analyze if you if you read ever uh, that uh, jane austen's letters austen wrote a number of letters to her sister cassandra and to her nephews and nieces she has written tons and tons of letters many of them were destroyed by cassandra because she did not want facts about uh, you know austen to come into the public but then many letters have remained and uh, if you read those letters you will find that almost every letter is occupied with money so austen is sometimes telling her a sister that she wanted to buy this but it was so expensive and so she bought this or she has bought something which was more expensive and she did not she should not uh, have bought it she was not in a position to afford it but somehow she has bought it and she is feeling guilty about it and then if she has received a gift if she is writing a letter in fact austen is said to have been concerned even about you know the pages that she had to buy in order to write her novels so good pages in those days were quite expensive and particularly for a woman of austen's means because as i said austen did not inherit a large sum of money she had a very small income coming in she was not married she was largely dependent upon the uh, you know the generosity of her brothers and her sister in laws and therefore it was difficult for her with her meager uh, economic resources to make ends meet so in a, in her letters she is also supposed to have uh, exclaimed over you know this buying of pages and which is why if you uh, if you read you will find that in her first drafts austen never you know wasted space you will find there is least paragraphing in her first drafts and even when she is paragraphing she does not change the line or she does not you know indent her paragraphs because she is very very conscious about not wasting space page because she has to buy all these pages with her own money even when she is sending and receiving letters letters which come to her uh, they, they they are not you know she has to pay for them to receive the letter that was the practice in those days and she is evaluating after she has received the letter from her brother she is evaluating whether the letter was worth paying the money that she uh, you know she paid for it as postage or not so austen was uh, extremely concerned about her finances she had to be concerned about her finances being a single woman and being in a position of little money and this concern about finances translates itself to her heroines as well so yes you are very right that elizabeth's perception of darcy is affected by her visit to pemberley had she not visited pemberley we do not know whether she would have reconsidered darcy uh, as a good suitor or not Yes, Amrit. Okay, so I think Surabhi Kashyap has a question. Surabhi, please unmute yourself. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Yes, uh, ma'am. My question is: as most of Jane Austen's novels also pay particular attention to the houses and the estates of the different characters, so in a way, do you think the houses and estates function as outward signs of their owner's inward character? Yes, in a big way, you can say that because uh, you know Austen was writing about a feudal setup where uh, people had. Uh, you know, landed people had big states and these states were not only uh, owned by them but also the the, the well being of the tenants of these states had to be assured by them so for example uh, you find in george eliot's middle march you find that george eliot is continually giving advice uh, in, in middle march dorothea is uh, is giving advice to her friend on how you know he can manage his state better so the the management of the state would largely be the the job of the male you know the, the male heir and the head of the household and uh, therefore the state's management would also in a way reflect the person's character so if the states were open and well managed and well taken care of and everybody happy it would imply that uh, the owner was a man of rich uh, or high moral character so uh, certainly these states uh, function as symbols of the social standing and as also of the moral standing of the owners of those states but also these states function as a symbol of their economic standing so you know uh, the the economics in austens uh, play uh, austens novels have to be understood from the place that she allots you know to these large states so you will find that in the course of uh, visiting these states the various observations that the uh, heroine makes about them are pertinent observations to the understanding of the character both of the uh, female protagonist as also of the male protagonist so 
this is where you know we have to understand that austin makes a distinct place for economics and we should not forget that her novels are just not about love and marriage they are also about uh, economics they are also about you know uh, socio cultural relationships uh, between individuals yes surabhi does that satisfy you yes ma'am thank you good evening ma'am yes hello ma'am am, yes. am i audible yes you are audible okay uh, ma'am uh, as we came, as proceeding throughout the novel we came to know that uh, darcy as a man gives dowry to other man so ma'am uh, my question is that how dowry plays a different role in these two uh, man as in the relationship of lydia and rickham as well as in elizabeth and darcy uh well now you see that uh, you know uh, had darcy not made a kind of arrangement uh, we know that uh, wickham would never have married lydia because wickham was a man who was interested and uh, nobody why why only wickham you know uh, every man in austen times uh, if he was well settled he would be looking for a beautiful wife and if he was not well settled he would be looking uh, for a rich wife right so every man you know and that is how pride and prejudice begins isn't it pride and prejudice begins that every man you know uh, every eligible bachelor who has a good fortune will be in need of a wife so as far as the eligible bachelor with a good fortune is concerned he will need a beautiful wife uh, in most cases a beautiful wife though in some cases like darcy also may be an intelligent wife uh, but as far as the you know per person of wickham social standing is concerned he will be interested only in marrying a woman with sufficient dowry so uh, you realize that when uh, wickham and media elope they are said to have gone to get married now in those times uh, the marriage laws in england were very strict uh, in, uh, you know for for all women below the age of 25 a consent had to be sought from their parents for the marriage and then uh, the bans had to be proclaimed earlier and then the marriage would take place in the church with due ceremony so sometimes people in order to escape all this they would you know go to switzerland to get married uh, where it was things were relatively easy so when uh, lydia and wickham elope they were supposed to have gone to switzerland to get married where they could have got married without the consent of their parents but news comes to the uh, you know bennet family that they have not yet gone there they are still together in a living relationship they are living together without having got married now this was a source of scandal and this would jeopardize the marriage of all the girls in the bennet family so if a girl uh, if if the youngest daughter has committed something like this you know Uh, that would jeopardize the reputation of the family it would also you know be uh, be something uh, negative for each of these girls standing in the way of their own successful marriages so there was no chance then uh, by which you know jane could get married or by which elizabeth could get married to someone else everything would be filtered by this uh, you know this elopement of lydia and here darcy having the means to do so also having known wickham earlier because we know that uh, wickham had done something very similar with his own sister and therefore darcy you know he comes into the play here also probably because he wants to please elizabeth uh, he comes into the play here and he offers uh, wickham uh, a certain sum of money uh, which he will acquire if he marries lydia so as long as uh, you know uh, the, the the couple remain in marriage uh, wickham would be annually receiving a certain sum of money so this of course prompts wickham to marry lydia and this also brings uh, elizabeth closer to darcy because uh, without his intervention something like this would not have happened so darcy is doing it both you know to to uh, assure uh, you know his his commitment towards the bennet family and he's also doing it to please elizabeth okay uh, yes, there is one there is one more question by manpreet broka i think that will be the final question that we will take for the session because you have been yes. speaking yes. for a long time yes oh no it's all right yes uh how far is the statement true that jane austen was a secret radical or an angry subversive uh well i think both of them uh, would be very true uh, manpreet and it's a good observation that yes jane austen you know uh, she subverts she subverts uh, the power equation in her novels so of course the power rests with the uh, superior gender it rests with uh, the patriarchal class it rests with the man and yet you find that austen's heroines do not easily give way to their men 
so uh, it, it is it is both ways the heroine also has to uh, you know she also has to go on a self journey she also has to shed her own weaknesses in order to enter into a respectable union with somebody but at the same time you know this is also required on the part of the male the male also must shed his or her weaknesses he must shed uh, his uh, you know his pride of being a man and he must openly interact uh, about their relationship before a kind of you know comrade camaraderie can be uh, accomplished between them so jane austen in a way she is using uh, you know the only resource that women have to subvert the power equation is women's intelligence and this you know this rationality this intelligence is the weapon that austen's heroines use to subvert the power structure so you may have someone uh, very rich like darcy and you may have someone like elizabeth who has no future if she doesn't get married right so elizabeth's uh, position is very similar to charlotte lucas's position but charlotte lucas you know she can uh, she can demean herself to marry a man like uh, Uh, Mr Collins because uh, she is afraid of her future she is afraid that she is 27 years old she is not very good looking she does not have much money and if she does not marry now what will happen to her now this is something this this vision of the future is something which austen's best heroines reject they say that we are not concerned about what will happen tomorrow what matters is what do i have today and if today you know i'm i i am supposed to compromise myself compromise with my identity and with my uh, understanding of the world in entering into a relationship i would not do it so austens uh, heroines are very fearless in the way that they can they do not visualize about a future of economic destitution they are very fearless they use their intelligence to their advantage they are very outspoken they are very bold uh, they they do not uh, hesitate to speak their minds and they do not hesitate to bring out their intelligence before men who in turn you know have to appreciate their intelligence before they can get married to these women so i believe that uh, jane austen's uh, repeated you know a uh, repeated portrayal of very sound and very intelligent women characters is is uh, is a way by which she subverts the power equation so she refuses to project women as feminine so called feminine you know very beautiful exotic creatures Uh, whose face value is everything so for most of austen heroines you realize they are not very beautiful they are very simple they are very common but what distinguishes them from the rest of women is of course the intelligence and the way they use their intelligence and their eloquence so uh, that is how i believe that yes you can say that she was a secret radical uh, she was trying her best to assure uh, you know a viable future for her women without making them uh, compromise according to uh, patriarchal codes Does that satisfy you, Manpreet? Yes, ma'am. Well, I think it does. Okay, <laughs> okay. Thanks, okay. Manpreet. That was a good question. Uh, thank you so much, Basudera Di, for this beautiful, you know, thing that you have done today. So, what I feel today is that Basudera Di has managed to remove the barrier of virtual session. you know not even for a moment i felt that this was happening through a wall so basudi you have given all of us some fresh windows and i think we can survive the difficult times watching and breathing through them so thank you very thank you much thank you so much it is always you know a privilege to be with good people uh, and i i must once again you know varsha congratulate you Uh, and your department for um, producing wonderful students i really take pride in your students i happen to see most of your students doing wonderful things many of them i am connected to connected uh, with through facebook and i see them doing wonderful things and i keep on feeling so proud of them as if they were my own students so the way that uh, you people are grooming them up in your department and in your college it is wonderful to see uh, young men and women of this age so sensitive towards social issues uh, so you know bent towards creative things that it's really a delight talking to all of you thank you very much for having me here thank, thank you, you so richa. much thank Basu. you it so much richa <laughs> thank you richa for joining in and making it even rich by your presence yes, richa. thank you basu so for much. everything that you do for us okay. everything that you do for us for this to
wonderful i bored people uh, i bored quite a number of people uh, it was quite a long uh, you know session it, it goes on with austin so so let us hope uh, we get opportunities to meet and interact again thank you very much for having me here rasha see you thank then. you vasudev thanks okay, a lot see you everybody students bye thank you bye